Tim, this is no Netflix, but this will have to do. How you doing? Good. I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Let's talk about this documentary. How'd that come about? Uh, I did a documentary with Netflix called Malice in the Palace. And uh, I was one of the guys they interviewed and they knew about my story. So they said, uh, you know, down the line, we'd like to, you know, do one on you. And I didn't really think I was going to hear from them. And then a couple of years later, I ended up hearing from them. And, uh, you know, we started to do the filming. Was it tough to go down that road? I mean, I know you talk about this stuff a million times. It's obviously been all over. Must have been a bit tough, I guess. Just You know, to be honest with you, it is. Because what people don't realize is, uh, you know, I was sitting in that chair for nine hours a day for three <laughs> days. And, you know, there was one question at the end where they asked me about money. And I was right. so tired and I couldn't wait to get out of there. And, uh, you know, I just said I didn't know. And then I was like, wait a second, what was that question? And, and yeah. the way that they put it out there was almost like I was trying to avoid how much money I was given in the whole thing. And it, that was just the, really the one part that really bothered me about it, right. how the editing um, can really just make or break you. And these people sometimes, I'm not saying Netflix did, but, you know, in, in some stories in the media, you know, now that I, I know what goes on behind the scenes, I, I just think that they edit it in a way that really can hurt somebody and it's not the way the question was asked or what the uh, answer was for but they still throw it out there in a different way and you know it really makes people think different of somebody when they really shouldn't yeah let's talk about your story a bit refereeing is a unique field people don't know much about it how do you get into it I got into it because my dad was a top college basketball referee at the time. He did the final four, three years in a row. And, um, you know, I kind of grew up around it, traveling to games with him. And, uh, you know, when you love basketball and you're playing it and you realize that, you know, you're not going to be at that next level, what's the next, you know, avenue that I can do to be a part of the game? Some people go into coaching, some people go into officiating. And I was one of those guys that, went into officiating because in my local area, not only was my dad a top guy, but we had Joey Crawford, Steve Javi, uh, Wonderlich, Crawford, Strom, Middleton. We had so many big name referees that were from that area that, you know, you really got a lot of help in, in learning, you know, what to do and how to do it pretty quickly. How does the process work? How does the hierarchy work? Uh, in the, in the NBA, um, you know, there's a supervisor of officials that usually worked in the league for 20, 25 years and was successful. And uh, then he reports to, uh, you know, somebody above him. At my time, it was Rod Thorne, uh, who was um, the VP of operations. And, um, you know, then there's all the referees that are under those two guys. And if there's a problem or a situation in a game, you're going to hear from one of those two people. And uh, hopefully it's not to the point where it's that bad and you, you learn from it because, even the greatest of referees are, uh, you know, in situations where they made a mistake or they handled something wrong. And it's just a process of learning from it and not making that same mistake again, just like anything in life. And is it something like pro sports? Do you go to high school and then college and then you effectively escalate over time? Yeah, for you have to start out, you know, roughing the little kids games, getting your feet wet, mo moving into high school, eventually college or for me. Uh, you know, I went into the CBA, which at the time was the minor leagues of the NBA and, um, you know, worked three years there. Now it's the developmental league that they have the referees go into. But, uh, you know, it, it's uh, at that time, it was a, a long, lonely road being on the road in the CBA, you know, 26, 27 days a month in, in cities you really never heard of. Uh, low budget hotels, uh, you know, twenty five dollars a day per diem. So um, you really had to want it and, and put the time and effort in in order to, to get where you needed to go. What's the percentage of people that obviously don't make it relative to folks who do? You know, when I was there, I, I think there was probably about 20, 25 people uh, that were in the CBA with me and three of us ended up making it. So, um, you know, the odds aren't great, but they try to give you signals pretty quickly that you're not going to make it to the NBA so that you can move on with your life. But at that time, they, they needed a good group of officials in case there was a lockout or a strike by the referees. So they had to have that pipeline of a bunch of guys that could step in and work the games in the event that that happened. 
And I've always wanted to ask, I know these things for you was a job, um, but when you're around professional athletes so intimately, so often, you know, these are folks about whom people lose their minds, right? Go crazy, the Jordans, the LeBrons, the Kobe's, and then you've been around all of them. Again, I know for you, it's a job. Do you ever stop and pinch yourself or, or kind of look around and say, wow, this is, this is something? You know, definitely early on, you know, my first game was in Chicago uh, and a preseason game, and I'm on the floor with Michael Jordan. And, you know, no doubt about it, you know, you, you, when you're a younger guy, you, you stand out there and you're like, oh, my God, here's Kobe, here's LeBron, here's Michael Jordan. But it quickly wears off because if you're not out there concentrating and you miss something, they're going to turn around and look at you like you're the biggest idiot in the world. So, you know, you really have to maintain your composure and your, uh, you know, concentration so that you're officiating the game as the rules are. And so at you know, one point you're learning a lot of, earn a lot of respect from those type of guys. So you really don't want to be looked at as somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Do you have a moment that sticks out a favorite moment involving a player or a game? You know, I do. I get that question a lot. And, uh, you know, as a young referee, I was in San Antonio and David Robinson, uh, you know, popped out and he liked to shoot that little, uh, you know, 10, 12 foot jumper right off the glass. And he jumped out and I got caught in a position where I was really looking at his back, where that's like, a, a, you know, a problem because you need to create an open space to see the window of the defender. And I didn't see the defender and he shot a shot, shot an air ball and the guy had hit him right on the elbow but I didn't want to guess and I wasn't sure there was a timeout and he, you know, gave me a little bit of grief, but not much because he was really a great guy. And after the timeout, he came up to me and said, Tim, you know, I got fouled there. I said, you know what? Playing it back. I know you did. I got put in a bad position. I didn't see it. I apologize. Smashed me on the back and he says, don't worry about it. Just, you know, try to get in a better position and don't miss it on me the next time. Miss it on somebody else. So, you know, there are guys like that that are just, uh, you know, have a great way of handling, you know, stuff. Right. You know, other guys like Rashi Wallace, you know, they want to fist fight you. And, you know, that way of being combative with the referees, you're never going to give that guy that call that could go either way. David Robinson, you know, I always made sure, you know, if it was marginal, I gave him everything because he was such a great guy. That's so funny. You mentioned a minute ago the malice at the palace. I remember I was in a hotel room in Florida with my parents. Uh, and we turned on the TV. I was a kid and I saw this spectacle. What was going through your mind? I mean, that must have been insane. How the hell am I going to get out of here alive? <laughs> when I tell you that stuff was flying onto that court, you know, um, chairs and, and different things. And, you know, just seeing uh, Jermaine O'Neal, when the one guy ran at him on the court, he wound up to punch him. And if the court wasn't so wet, and he didn't lose his back foot. I think he would have killed that guy because he hit him. You know, I never saw somebody take a punch like that in my life. And he lost his back foot, which, you know, took a lot of the power out of it. So right. it, was, uh, it, was, it was tough because, you know, I'm looking around for Rashi Wallace because everybody's fighting. And I'm thinking, man, here's his chance to take a, you know, the shot he always wanted. And, uh, you know, it was uh, it was just a difficult, difficult night. And, you know not something you want it to be associated with as a referee. Wow. Is your instinct to take cover or is your instinct to sort this out? I mean, you're still in the role of a referee. Absolutely. Sort it out. I mean, your job as a referee is to try to, you know, de-escalate this thing as quickly as possible. But, you know, no matter what the three of us did, it was, and there was a lot of police officers that were also trying to help out just, when it stopped in one area, it started in another. So we just knew at that point we were going to have to call the game. And we just, you know, took off for the tunnel and got into the locker room. Wow. All right. Let's talk a bit about uh, the ordeal that uh, led to your leaving the NBA. How did you know Batista and Martino? Um, I knew that. I didn't really know much of Batista. I knew Tommy Martino from high school. Uh, we kind of hung out a little bit. Um, Batista was really from his area and hung out with his older brother. So from time to time, I would see him. He was one of those, you know, guys in high school that was on steroids so that, you know, he stood out like a sore thumb and you just knew to stay away from him. Uh, so I really was never friends with him. Uh, it was more or less Tommy Martino. And 
did you know if they had reputations, backgrounds? You know, at, at that time, the high school I'm from, you know, all the Italians like to portray that they're in the mob. They give them that, you know, credibility. Uh, and, you know, there were some people whose, whose parents were, uh, you know, Batista and Martino, as far as I, I knew, weren't. Uh, you know, it wasn't until later on that I found out, you know, really what Batista was involved in and who he was hanging out with. And how did it all begin in terms of the, the business relationship? You know, what happened was, is I was betting a lot with a, a guy I knew from the country club. And um, what I didn't realize is he was putting the bets in through somebody else. And all these guys, not Martina, but Batista and Ruggieri had access to these bets. They knew him and I were very friendly. They started to put two and two together and they were piggybacking the bets and making millions and millions of dollars. Then when the guy and I stopped, Batista wanted to continue to get that information. He knew I was friends with Tommy still, you know, told Tommy that next time I was around, he wanted to see me. And Tommy didn't really know why. And he brought him down to the uh, airport Marriott one time thinking we were just going to grab dinner and didn't realize why Batista wanted me and what he was going to say to me. And you were at that point at the top of your profession, you were making good money. What was going through your head? You know, I should have never been gambling to begin with, you know, prior to anything. You're really, my contract stated, I, I shouldn't place a bet of any kind. I had a great life, like you just said, making great money, great cars, big house, country club memberships. And uh, I was just down that slippery slope of uh, gambling on everything, casinos, golf. You know, I was basically hooked. So, uh, you know, when Batista showed up, he had been saying that he was getting the picks for years and he wanted to continue to get the picks. If not, he would expose me for gambling, right? Because by my contract, I wasn't supposed to place a bet of any kind. So he had me there. And, you know, worst case scenario, uh, you know, send somebody down to Florida where I'm from. So it, it was just a scenario where, Either way, he had me, and I figured if I gave him picks for the rest of that year, everything would die out, and that would be the end of it. But, you know, unfortunately, that didn't happen. And logistically, how did it work? Um, you know, I would call Tommy Martino and basically give him the play by code that day, and he would relay it to Batista, who would uh, place the bets and, and kick us back $2,000 for every correct pick. But Batista was betting millions and millions of dollars, and we didn't know, but red flags were going up all over the place from, you know, people that he was just beating up financially, uh, overseas cas casinos, uh, you know, Vegas casinos, anybody where he could get that action down, you know, he was crushing them. And this may obviously be an obvious question. Why didn't you think you can maybe go to the authorities, maybe go to somebody else? You were just afraid, obviously, because you were in – either spot. way either way I, I was done you know they I, I wasn't supposed to place a bet of any kind here in the past I was betting on NBA games even my own games before him with another guy so it was just a situation where I thought you know I was between a rock and a hard place and, and neither place was you know going to be helpful for me hopefully I, I do this for him and at the end of this year that's it and uh you know that's the end of it and how long did that last prior to your visit from the FBI? It lasted from December to the end of uh, April, I believe, but um, we really didn't, he, Batista ended up going into rehab. So there was, you know, 30 or 40 days there. So it was really for about two months. And, um, you know, I, I know that we won about 80 to 85% of the bets and uh, he did very, very well, but it was because of his drug addiction, gambling addiction. He had every addiction you can, uh, you know, basically have. He lost it all. So, um, you know, it was a situation where he was in a bad spot at the end of it. Now, when folks ask me what is the most difficult position a client could be, and I typically say it's somebody that calls me up and says, the FBI are at my house. What do I do? Uh, right. Tell me about that. No, I tell you what you should do is keep your fucking mouth shut, but that's not what I did, right? That is um, what you should do. That's right. 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 And I was blessed where I had, you know, a great attorney in, um, you know, Nick Mooney, when I had to sue the lady for my book, my criminal case, John Laurel, uh, you know, when I was going through that, what we're going to talk about. And then, of course, you who helped me out with 
uh, you know, certain situations at the end of all that. So I, I've been blessed to have really people say all this negative things about attorneys. And when I tell them I had three of the best and I enjoyed them, they look at me like I'm nuts. So I don't know why you guys get the, the rap that you get. Um, I don't know either. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, the thing was, is, the, you know, I was I was on the driving range and, and getting ready to play golf. And Tommy called me and said, listen, the FBI was here. I said, for what? He goes, um, for you. And they were here three times. And I was just like, you know, right away sick, put the clubs back in the bag and went home. Uh, I guess if, for about three weeks, I literally didn't need anything. I lost 25 pounds and uh, I went to an attorney in the area and he just said, keep your mouth shut. Let me call there and see what's going on. And he called the United States attorney who was furious that Martino told me what was going on. And he said, listen, I'm going to give you a message and you give it to Tim Donaghy. And I, I was there. It was on speakerphone. So I heard this. He said, you tell him we know what he did. We know who he did it with. It's only a matter of time before we come get him. So he's better off coming to us and losing his job rather than us coming to him. And not only is he going to lose his job, but he's going to go to jail for a long, long time. So, you know, I had an option, you know, do I roll the dice or do I, you know, go in there with my tail between my legs? And I chose to go in there with my tail between my legs and tell them everything I had been doing and, and who I had been doing it with. And, you know, at that point, I knew it was the end of my career. And so you hire a lawyer, the lawyer calls the prosecutor, and the next step is a meeting or a proper session, or what was it? Yeah, a, a meeting, which, you know, is a proper session. And, right. you know, what's it called? King or queen for a day, I queen forget. For a day. Where they say, you know, you tell us everything and we can't use it against you, and, and which is total bullshit because, you know, they could you use know it what, to impeach. They could use it to uh, further investigate. They could use it for perjury purposes, but they can't use it in the direct case against you. That's the point. Right. But they can go in a roundabout way and, and they can they can, like you just said, they, they could still use it in, in a way. Um, and, uh, you know, I went in there and, uh, you know, told them everything. And they looked at me like I had 12 heads, really didn't believe a thing I said of how I was picking the games uh, correctly. And you know, did their own investigation, flying people around the country. And next thing I know, they call me back in there and, uh, you know, they want me to be a cooperating witness uh, against, uh, you know, the mafia and against people in the NBA. And uh, before I went back in there, uh, for some reason, they had had a meeting with the NBA and they had leaked the story to the New York Post so that nobody else would talk to me. Um, and that's the one thing about David Stern. He always seemed to be one step ahead of everybody, no matter what it was, collective bargaining agreements or this, where, you know, he may have known in the back of his head, you know, I don't want somebody saying something that's going to incriminate more, more of my referees. You know, if, if I were to wear a wire and spoke to somebody like they had wanted me to do. So he felt this is my way of warning everybody else to stay away from him and leak the story to the New York Post, which, you know, everybody then knew that stay away from me. Now, I always tell people that DNA and video evidence are the two real types of evidence that are really tough to overcome if you're a criminal defense lawyer. I guess wiretaps are an extension of that. Uh, was that the primary reason that you ultimately pled guilty? No, I, I pled guilty because, you know, deep down, I knew I did something wrong. Uh, you know, and, and it bothered me, to be honest with you. And, uh, you know, in a selfish way, I thought that that guy, Tom Siegel, who said, you know, you're better off coming to us and losing your job rather than I'm come get you. We're going to come get you and you're going to lose your job and go to jail. So I thought they wouldn't put me in jail, you know, if I went to them and told them the truth. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And uh, you know, there's a lot of times I think back and, and think to myself, man, if I would have kept my mouth shut, you know, what real evidence did they have against me? And John Lauro, who was the attorney in the criminal case, you know, really says legally, he's not too sure that they really had a case against me. But, you know, that's, you know, hindsight looking back. And the cooperation would involve what? The cooperation just involved me telling them everything I did and how I did it, who was involved, how much money was made. And, uh, you know, basically 
uh, you know, giving up everything that, that they wanted. And, you know, what blew their mind was really how the NBA was involved in prolonging these playoff series by training and programming the referees that morning with film sessions uh, and putting a team that was down in the series at an advantage. And, you know, it really kind of, you know, blew their mind how, you know, league officials would come into the locker room at halftime and tell you to look for certain things and call it in the second half. And it was always in favor of that team that was down uh, in, in the series in order to prolong it. Now let's talk about that. Obviously, you're not saying that the NBA fixes games. What you're saying is, uh, I suppose, that they're uh, – financial and marketing issues at stake. And they, uh, I suppose, do something to make it so that referees act in a certain way. Uh, and the argument, the counter argument to that would be, well, there's so many people involved. There's more than one referee on the court. It would be really tough to coordinate that kind of effort. Um, how did the process work? What would happen is during the playoffs, uh, somebody from the league office would come in and sit you in a hotel room and show you plays from the previous games and saying that the previous three referees missed these plays, uh, you know, or the previous referees before them missed these plays. So this is what we're going to show you. We're going to show you the missed plays. Make sure you go out and don't miss it tonight. And, you know, they'd show you maybe 25 plays. And 20 of those plays are now going to be calls that are going to help the team that's down in the series because they're showing you plays against the other team. OK, that were missed. So, you know, your mindset is you're going out there looking for certain things because the NBA game is so fast. But when you see it on film and then you see it live, it's, it's kind of in a, a slow motion for you and, and you're able to, you know, make the call. And that's how they would really go out and, and dictate and program the referees to prolong series. They're not saying I'm not saying they said go out there and fix this or right. make sure that this team wins or make sure LeBron James goes to the bench with three quick fouls no they did it within you know the rules of saying you know if you want a good grade for this game and you want to advance to the next round and make another thirty thousand dollars you know i'm grading you on this make sure you call it. and and it's so tough because you're dealing with calls that are so subjective right and you're dealing with people with emotions right i mean you're a referee but you're a human being right and so if you have a player that acts in a certain way or upsets you or bothers you i guess subconsciously right it's tough to separate yourself although you're doing a job no no doubt but you know when you look at the nba game the big thing is freedom of movement they want the players to be able to run up and down the floor put on a show and um you know score a lot of points it's, it's better for the tv and and the league when it's 120 to 118 rather than 85 86 you know it's more exciting so you know when you talk about freedom of movement. It, it's so easy. Like you said, it's so subjective to call foul on this guy or that guy, you know, especially along those lines of, of freedom of movement. So uh, it, it's just something that, uh, you know, the league knows it's, it's entertainment. And even Phil Scala, who was the supervisory special agent thought that the NBA was in a lot of trouble, but the, at the end of each broadcast, it says NBA entertainment, right? Just like they put at the end of a wrestling match in, in the, uh, you know, pro wrestling. So he just says they are allowed to conduct their business any way they want, uh, you know, and, and he was in shock that, you know, that little statement there really relieved them of, of any wrongdoing and, and really doing what they were doing. And is there ever uh, something that favors a particular player, a star player, a, pra a player that brings in the eyeballs? No doubt. I mean, they would, you know, the veteran referees would tell you and even the group supervisors would tell you that, you know, uh, LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Shaquille O'Neal, uh, they make a lot of money. They put a lot of people in the stands who pay a lot of money to sit courtside. So don't be calling cheap fouls on them and sending them to the bench because, you know, that's what the league is built on. People coming to see these guys. So if there's plays where they're involved and, and they really committed the foul, you know, if you can give it to somebody that's near there, don't give it to that star player, give it to that lesser player let the fouls build up on him so that the stars don't have to leave the game. And you put in bets on your own games, right? But you never uh, would do so to the point where you effectively would change an outcome. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely bet on my own games. Uh, you know, I've talked about that many times, but did I go out there and, and make sure Shaquille O'Neal had, you know, quick fouls and he went to the bench and put his team at a, a disadvantage? No, definitely not. 
Uh, I just knew what the three referees were going to call, you know, based on what the group supervisor, you know, told us to do that day. And at times it put teams at, you know, a disadvantage. And if I would look in the USA today and, you know, see the line was five, I'd say, geez, after this meeting, you know, they're not going to lose by five. You know, they're, they're going to lose by 15 if, if we crack down on what, you know, they want us to crack down on. And, and that's what I did. How often do you, as a, an un, un, uninterested party at this point, watch a basketball game and point to the screen and say, oh, well, maybe that's something that uh, I know what's happening there, in other words? Nail or in the past? Now? You know, often, I mean, I see a lot of times where, you know, LeBron James will take five steps and, and dunk the basketball you know, and, and be a couple steps inside half court and nobody calls a traveling violation on him. Then you see some, you know, guy in the corner that nobody knows that barely moves his pivot foot and there's a travel call. So definitely nail the names on the front and the back of jerseys are still, you know, officiated rather than the rules and as they're written in the rule book. I wonder, this was what, uh, 15 years ago um, that this all went down. These days, technology is obviously a bit more developed. Uh, there are recording devices and there are cameras with high definition quality. Do you think that matters? In other words, there are things you could now see, things you could pay attention to that you couldn't necessarily do in the past. Not that this was decades ago, but it was a while ago. Right. I think, that, like you said earlier, the game is so subjective. Um, it's like the rules just aren't real black and white in, in regard to, you know, this is a foul, this is a travel violation. And, you know, you can choose to call things, you know, depending on who it is and the time and score and, you know, so many different things. So there's no, uh, you know, real black and white, uh, you know, set of rules. And I, I think as long as they continue to, you know, have so many subjective elements to the game that, you know, I, I think, you know, people are treated differently and, you know, it, it could happen again. Do you think that uh, anything could be done to fix this? Anything to, that could be done that could uh, work to try to rectify the problem? No, I just think that you need to allow these referees to go out and enforce the rules as they're written in the rule book. Forget about the star treatment, the big market teams. You know, just go out and uh, judge the referees as, as you know, individuals on the calls that they make and don't make and put the best referees on the floor, you know, come playoff time in the end of the year. I think that's what they do in college. But unfortunately for the NBA, you'll see the same 10 referees in the NBA finals for the you know last 10 years. And you can't tell me that every year out of 65, 70 guys, these same 10 guys are the best every year. It's just to me, it's, it's not possible. I understand, Tim. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. You got it anytime.